12, 12, once in a lifetime. I guess the end of the world is coming uh, any minute now, right? No, it's too late. Something like that. 12, 21. So, if we don't see you next month, it's nice to see you. But tonight, uh, first we have a couple of announcements. Uh, there's going to be a uh, flat river cleanup on January 12th. Um, Atlantic City, you know, what's the name of the park? Sailor's Crossing, Flat City, First and Main Street. First and Main in Flat City. 9 to noon, Saturday the 12th. One month from today. And it'll be warm. And then uh, I wanted to pitch this book, Bringing Nature Home, that the uh, Prairie Foundation is selling as a uh, fundraiser. Uh, it's all about backyard habitat. I'm sure you've read a lot about backyard habitat and fruit trees and berries and for the birds. Well, this has a great section on bugs. It's hard to find a lot of natural history on bugs. This talks about the different plants for the bugs, the different birds that eat the bugs. It's not just berries, but the bugs are an essential food source too. So this is a fantastic book. It's uh, say it retails for $17.95, and I think what $12.50? Fifteen fifty if they mail it to you for the Prairie Foundation. You can get it directly from uh, Doris. It's uh, twelve fifty. I have an addition there. Okay. Doug Chamney, the author, has a lecture on YouTube, and once you hear his lecture, it's a fascinating and the you will buy. So you can go to you can go to YouTube and click on Doug Chamney and you will know, and
understanding, in many cases, the Missouri River itself. Policies, management decisions, science that's done in the Missouri River are also affected by things outside. For example, the Missouri River exports water to Mississippi. We've heard a lot about that recently. For example, it might be that the Missouri River is going to export water to Denver. That's actually within the case, it's like the same thing. And that was in the news recently, uh, as an example. Uh, Southern and Queen's water, there's a connection between the Missouri River and the rest of the world as well. I'm going to just concentrate on the Missouri River itself, which is uh, really big. There's one thing you can go away with tonight, it's this fact. The Missouri River is a semi arid river. We live down here where it tends to be hot and humid. But this basin is semi arid. It should be treated that way in terms of being careful and cautious about water shortages and water distribution. Most of the basin is uh, covered by uh, annual rainfall that's uh, between 500 and 250 inches a year, between 20 and 10 inches a year. It's not very much rainfall. And that's why it really high spot. Famous quote attributed to Mark Twain. Um, and there will be, my one prediction that I feel, is that there will continue to be lots of fighting over water in the Missouri River Basin. And it goes back to the fact that there really is not enough water to go around. The Missouri River has uh, got a lot of variability, geographically. These are the people regions, which kind of follow geology. Uh, it runs through the Ozark Plateaus down here. A lot of it's in the central lowlands, which is a glaciated area. Most of it's in the Great Plains. Uh, sediments have been shut off the Rocky Mountains uh, for the last uh, 10 million years or so. And then the, the main divide is the Rocky Mountains. It's one of the high Rocky Mountains with all the rugged topography and snow accumulation and snow melt. But in addition to that bedrock geology, the Missouri River has been messed with by the Pleistocene. And that is these continental ice sheets that have come down from the north and messed with the basin and rearranged the drainage. And this has had an effect on the Missouri River that we see today. I have down here this white line, that's the southernmost limit of what's called the Canadian Wisconsin Glaciation. We you take a look at the last two million years, there's a classic division into four major glaciations. A lot of geologists feel now that there could be a dozen, maybe two dozen, of those major ice advances. What we know is that before about 50,000 years ago, there were some that hit our this space. But we know a lot about the most recent one called the Wisconsin Glacier, which receded about 12,000 years ago. And as you can see, it kind of messed with the Missouri River. And that's part of the story that I've got uh, today. So we have this geologic variability, we've got the Pleistocene glaciation kind of coming over the top of it, kind of messing with it. And this will give you a sense of what those glaciations did. This is a reconstruction of the major rivers. Um, of the U.S., of the central U.S., in the Pliocene, more than two million years ago. And what you can see here is that there are these rivers that were flowing north in the Hudson Bay. That's the Kono Upper Missouri River, flowing north in the Hudson Bay. And this city river drainage was dominated by this thing called the Taze, Mississippi uh, drainage, which covers some of the Mississippi is today, and also includes lots of branches that don't exist today. Glaciers came down and covered up and, and moved those rivers around. The Platte and Kansas River were flowing south of Oklahoma, a town was called Oklahoma. Okay, this is, there's some data to support this, but we know that these things are different. When the glaciers came down, multiple advances and moved things around. So the Missouri River today, instead of having this area that flows north, this all flows down to the south. And one of the curious implications of this is that I do a lot of stuff with cattle surgeon and major species. The quote unquote purest genetic strains of cattle sturgeon live up here in the upper Missouri and Yellowstone. There are cattle sturgeon all the way down in Mississippi, but they are not the same genetically. 
And it appears what's happening with Alex Virgin is that they were a northern species. The glaciers forced them south and mixed them up with other surgeon species over the last few million years. So this, this range of rearrangements is important not only physically for the system, but it's also important biologically. So it's been a dynamic system. Um, socially, it's dynamic. That part of the 10 states, two countries, 20 Native American tribes, uh, many of the tribes are not adjudicated as water rights. So they can decide to put their water in a variety of different places. They can send it to Denver, they can send it to Canada. It has 10 million people in it. They're very opinionated people. They tend to have a lot to say about how the zoo river is, uh, is operated. Um, it's interesting about the distribution of, of the population. Uh, St. Louis is about 2.9 million people. If you think about like leverage, Denver is about 2.5 million people. And I think this is relevant because of what came out of the news this last week about the Bureau of Nation saying we've got a plan to take water from Kansas City to Denver. Uh, there is some leverage, leverage to do that. Here's the state of the population. Most of the basin is very um, sparsely populated. And that means that from a progression of both point of view, most of the influence is down here. Uh, here. That sort of sets up a lot of the a lot of the uh, contentious debate in the, uh, the system. The Missouri River has been highly altered by dams. So these are the main stem dams. Um, uh, Gavin's Point, uh, all the way up to uh, Garrison Dam, it's a the land. These are all part of the Big Slope Plan in 1944. This is Canyon Ferry. These buildings over here were constructed and managed by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, Fort Peck Dam, which I'll show you more detail later on, was also constructed by the Corps of Engineers, but this was done in the 1930s, so it preceded these dams here. And Canyon Ferry was uh, developed by the Bureau of Regulation at the same time that these were developed after the Flood Control Act in 1934. So, just look at the, the six core main stem dams, 91 cubic kilometers of storage, even if you don't have a strong feeling of what a cubic kilometer looks like. A lot. You might think in terms of acre feet, this is 75 million acre feet. So you think about an acre or foot deep, and put 75 million of those together. That's a lot of water that's stored in here. It's about two times the energy level of the basin if you had to fill them up from a few next In a good year, but it's not a drought year, it will generate 10 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, which is a lot. It's about one and a half times a, uh, a large nuclear power plant. So I'll talk a little bit about why, even though it's, it's not a lot compared to the power plant, but a bunch of nuclear power plants, it's, uh, it's important because it's peak flow of the And then if you look at other dams in the system, there's another 40 kilometers of storage. This means that the fluxes of water in the system have been highly altered. Most of this operation is by the base that they have. So I'll be spending a lot of time talking about animals. And so I wanted to show you how that flow of water is developing. And there's a lot of emphasis on how the flow regime, that flow of water over time is developing because A, it's something that can manage the system. The Corps of Engineers can manage these reservoirs um, to change that flow regime. But in the world of, of, of um, aquatic ecology, it's considered that flow regime, flow water the system, is the master variable. It's one important thing. Again, it's not everything else. One thing you would do is pay attention to is how does water flow the system. And so a lot of emphasis is placed on changing the way the water is managed in the system. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to show a bunch of graphs like this to tell you what this is. Um, in gray is the natural flow region. This is what it looked like before the dams were put in. And I've got a band in here. This is discharge in two feet per second on this axis. How many feet per second? And this is the same year on this axis. And this band in gray is the, for each day of the year, the flow rate will be exceeded 25% of the time, and the flow rate will be exceeded 75% of the time. So that is 50% of the time the flow rate will be in 
there was a huge amount of sediment coming out of the observer, and in fact, it dominated the sediment board of the entire Mississippi River. Oh, no bite of it. No bite of it. Pardon?
very scenic in this area. This is uh, the Gates the Mountain. Blue is a point out there. That's these areas where you really come up through these very dramatic canyon areas. In this case, it's now flooded from the reservoir. Um, so it's, it's not as gnarly as the Gates the It's still quite beautiful. This is a little bit further down the street. We've already got a color. The river is a bedrock gorge. Parallel to Interstate 15 here, of the Great Falls. See the bedrock board, it's a very beautiful part of the river system, but uh, very constrained on the bedrock. A little bit upstream of Great Falls on the tail, and some of the old types of really wide plate. Look at this green flat area here. Lots of agriculture. You can see these uh, patterns where the channel used to be, the down each to the end or across there. Uh, it's very full area.
that would be very important. It's the rope which drains up to the road. This is what that spillway looked like in 2011 with the record flows coming down from the Missouri River. This spillway had been dry for about 50 years until 2011. And then they had to use it to, to take care of some of this excess water. Well, the reason the Milk River is important is that this dam, like many dams, releases its water to the powerhouse to generate electricity from low in, in the water column. And so the water is called hypomimetic release. And the water that comes out is cold. And that cold water is, has been implicated in seriously disrupting the ecosystem of the Missouri River downstream from it. The word right idea here is that for years, the Missouri River is low, and there's a lot of little water coming out of the Fort Cat. If there's a lot coming out of the hill, then turbid water, that lot of it, which is the river was naturally the warm water, can affect the Missouri River from the downstream. Why is this important? These are temperature data collected uh, by a polymer line, uh, temperature on the, on the y axis. Uh, Days of the year here, starting in April. The water coming out of the four pet dam is green right here, it's the coldest water. And then this, these are different sites downstream as we move downstream in Missouri River. We get some more of them downstream. This is the water that's coming out of the milk river. This is what the Missouri River would be natural. There's four to six degrees centigrade difference in here. And this cold water coming out of Fort Peck has been implicated before. Um, affecting the population of native fishers and, and a lot of the citizens are too cold and pallets early to spawn in that part of the river. So this issue of water temperature is an extremely important thing, especially here in Fort Peck and other, other dams along the river as well. This is downstream of Fort Peck. There's a nice wide area of valley, there's a lot of variability, there's a channel complexity here. In other words, good habitat. If the water wasn't clear, and if the water wasn't cold. But being clear and cold, this part of the river doesn't do too well with a lot of the native species, unless the milk river is dominating the flow. There's an interaction between us and the river. Um, I'm going to take, the whole idea is to try to get them all the way down the river. I'm going to take a short side trip up the Yellowstone. Uh, because it's a very important part of one of the policy and management of the Missouri River. This is the confluence of Yellowstone and Missouri. It's the Missouri coming down here, this Yellowstone coming here, and then Missouri going down uh, 30 miles downstream goes to the lakes of Copperhead. It goes past Winston, North Carolina. If you, well, from where I am, I can see that the water coming out of Yellowstone would be more sediment in it clear water that's coming down the Missouri River. In addition, the Missouri River is colder, and Yellowstone River is warmer. And as I was pointing out earlier, the flow regime, the sequence of flows through the year coming down the Yellowstone, is the most natural in North America. So from a management point of view, we have about 200 pack of sturgeon in this area. These are the genetic ones that are affected. And they had a choice, they could go up the Missouri River and they go up the Yellowstone. And what's been happening is that they have, they've been confused. They don't know what to do, but they had to reproduce it. And on one hand, people have said, well, what we can do is we can invest about 50 million dollars and put a temperature control structure at Fort Peck so the more water would come out. Or you can just expect those fish to go up the Yellowstone instead since the fish are like the river. The problem is that about 60 miles up Yellowstone is this little thing here. This is the intake Montana. This one looks like uh, it blow up a little bit. You see the, the ripple of the water rushing on it. It is essentially a big pile of rocks. It's been put in the river by the Bureau of Reclamation to build up the water over here so it will go down this vegetation path. This is what it looked like in uh, 2011. Now, this is a very really high flow, so some of the not as steep as it might look. But this is considered to be a major impediment 
lot of these people actually got flooded in 2011. Um, and there's a whole story there that I don't really have time to go into. But um, one of the things about dams is that they will control the flow of water and provide things like recreational opportunities and development opportunities. Uh, there is a risk associated with that uh, as people found out in 2011. And here's the delta of the Lake Milwaukee. It's an excellent amount of stream. Not as much sediment here, but most of the sediment is just dropped on the stream. Here's a water view of Lake Milwaukee that I can put up there to show us the, when you take the very uh, dissected landscape, you put the lake in there, just use patterns for it. This is the Milwaukee Dam down here, but here's the dam right here, and this is pure South Dakota. Here is very much at this one. Now, the from the dam. Clear cold water, lots of recreation on the river, lots of fishing, uh, and water development right down the river. The difference is that there's uh, Lake Sharp is very close here, and so there's actually volcanic sediments uh, in this area as well. Uh, here's just a, a picture from here looking across the lake. The lakes uh, are highly valued for recreation. Lots of fishing, lots of uh, boating in these lakes. Uh, and then this is from like right here, which is the south, showing you what the valley looks like. Uh, this is an area with uh, very highly esteemed water. So, you know, aquatic ecologists will never find a dam that they like. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of unoccupied opportunities associated with the dams. And the dams do what they're supposed to do most of the time. Control power generation and water supply. Uh, this is a uh, aerial photo I really like. This is called Big Ben for obvious reasons. Uh, and it shows what happened to the flood in the Mineral Valley like this. Um, sort of management issues in the lake. Uh, of course, there's collective farmland is flooded by right here. There's people who uh, lost that land and still have a lot to say about that. Today, the issues are bank erosion. We get some wind establishment set up on some of these lakes, and some bank erosion is taking place in the concern. As the water levels go up and down, there's also issues about water supply. Uh, a fair number of Indian tribe uh, have reservations through here, and their water supplies have, in recent past, been left high dry. The lake levels are going down. Um, probably the thing you hear about the most in these lakes the water level goes down and you can't finish your boat down and boat down to the lake. That's your people really have to see. And that's why you fear this is part of the stream down to the lake. Lake recreation is worth a lot of money. Recreation of the river in Kansas City, not so much. Let's show a couple of dams here. This is Fort Randall Dam moving down the stream. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and this is downstream from the Dam, and it's probably the best example of these deltas. This is the delta into Lewis and Clark Lake, which is dammed up by Gavin's Point Dam. A little bit off the screen up here is another water, which is draining a large part of Nebraska, uh, areas that produces a lot of sediment. And so this sediment is coming down and hits the lake and it falls down into this, in this delta. Look at the aquatic ecologists and say, this is great, we call it channel complexity. That shows a pair of sand holes here. Uh, the endangered uh, interior loose turn, and uh, the pipe and bubbles have been known to mess with some of these bodies. That seems like a good thing. The city of Springfield up here does not think it's such a good thing. They used to have a marina. They don't anymore. Uh, it's really hard to water ski. So, uh, and it's filling up some of the, some of the storage capacity uh, of the dam. Figure it in, and I have some data I can show it at the end of the talk about how much, how many years are left, or estimated to be left in the But this is, this is sort of you know, the generic issue. When you, when you put these dams in the system, they're going to um, hold the sediment, and they're going to give lines, and these are things that put your lines in the system. You know, down the stream, then we have the river, the Yankton, South Dakota, then the river, 
that has a moisture use settlement on it. And that has implications that we go into it. Before I do that, I want to talk about this graph. Because I think it's a really important thing about the sewer and water management. This is an example of comparing discharges on the Fort Randall scale, which is shown in black here. And the same time period, the discharges coming out uh, down this point there, I'm showing in blue. These are both hourly data, and I've got about uh, two months of the data here. And what you notice, or I hope you notice, is that what all of this is This is peaking flow, or uh, load following flows. Um, this is something that I would like that public plants can do. Those plants, for the most part, can do. They can't suddenly turn on and create electric power when the demand comes on in the middle of the day. The hydroelectric plants can do that. So even though these hydroelectric facilities on the Missouri River don't generate a total that much power, they provide load and following power. It's really important because that goes into, uh, into the uh, network and means that people in the post can all the internal energy And starting about in here, there are daily meetings. We're actually doing two a day here. The difference here is about 20,000 CFS, which in this river system, based on the geometry, is between four and six feet. So you're actually up twice a day. Up and down 26 feet. That, of course, has some ecological consequences. Uh, the other thing that it does is it to um, educate fish and small animals very quickly not to stay on the edges because they will be left behind. Um, there has been speculation by people about decommissioning dams in this river and say Gravis Point is the smallest. Dam and the least part of the lake behind is the smallest. It's filling up the fastest as we said it. Maybe that dam should be taken out. But what it does now is it works to the regulation dam. All these waves are coming through every day. Gavin's yeah, point evens that out. And so that's a function that would be lost if we lost the other thing. Um, the other thing that we have is the increase of seven million. So the seven data. The other thing is just downstream of uh, Gavin's Point Dam. Historically, 121 million tons a year in the past. Now it's 0.24 million tons a year. It's only 0.2% of what we used to have. That shows you how efficient the dam is in the top of the cover. From all the way down to Herman, it's really going to be used to carry 326 million tons a year. Now it's only 55 million tons a year. The second vote is like 17 percent than it was in the So this is a really, really big change in the system, and it has an effect. Sure. Here we have on these slides. We spend some time on this, but I do think it's important. This is uh, back in upstream to downstream to Dallas Point Dam is right here, mile 811, and St. Louis is down here. Kansas City is right here. Incidentally, right here, this thing is. What I've shown in green is the change essentially in the bed of the river over the last six years. So near the dam, there's the zero mark here, has gone right down almost a meter in the last six years. Um, the blue line is the drainage area, which shows really different areas of it. So the Platte River comes in right here, now it's straight from the Platte, the end of the river is actually increasing. There's been aggregation of the bed there. We've got erosion of the bed here, that position here, and then as many of you are aware, Kansas City, uh, big bed aggregation of the problem. And there's a lot of speculation about why that is, and you can see the problem is here. Uh, that is really the really problem now. This part of this is a result of the sediment is not coming through the dam. This part has been attributed to uh, sand mining or general engineering or variety of things. It's quite contentious. But everybody understands that this is because it's hungry water, clear water, and water that has this eroding dead. And that has implications. 
this is back from Davenport Dam, and we just got to St. John's, Missouri. And it's a little showing the flood plain, how dry it is and how wet it is, relative to the flood levels. So red here is a 500 year flood. Uh, dark blue is less than a two year flood. And what this shows is the effect of that net degradation here and aggregation here, down through the middle. And most of the floodplain up here is very dry. It stays up here, even with big floods. And down here, the floodplain floods a lot, and it's pretty wet. Of course, we saw that in 2000, uh, 2009. This is the same data. This is the proportion of the floodplain in Gavin's Point, and St. Louis. This is that dry area. This here is Kansas City, where the bed is dropped as well. So more of the floodplain area is at a dry elevation, but not as dry as it is here. And here, on the wet areas, most of the areas where there's a mixed flood concern, and where most of the flooding happened in 2011. This graph down here shows flooded acreage, and right near the dam, people in the school mostly had a came from, there wasn't a whole lot of flooding. That's because that dam was inside. Get down to Sioux City, you start to see some. And it's really down overall down in the Nebraska City area where that flooding really occurred. And this is sand deposition that was associated with that flood happening in that same area. So the, 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 the dam just has its effect trapping the sediment. There's an adjustment of the river channel, and that's affecting things like flood damage and flood hazard. The opposite side of that is if you wanted to restore floodplains, you were working against preferentially in the weather. Okay, so we get back to the river. This is the river below Camden's Point Dam. It's, a, it's administered by the National Park Service. It's Missouri National Treasure River. It's got a lot of channel complexity, which is a good thing. A lot of sandbars in it. Uh, the issues here are a lot of these sandbars are being restored mechanically for turning flood habitat. There's agency, there's agency uh, discussion and negotiation about it how much that should be happening, happening in a national recreational river, but a lot of that, that is happening for the native species. The other big management issue is bank stabilization. This part of the river is not used for navigation, but over a third of the banks have been stabilized. The Park Service, and the then mandate, feels that there should be no bank stabilization there. The landowners, under their mandate, feel that there should be bank stabilization. So that's a big issue. Um, this is the same area. After the 2011 flood, it's a spot satellite image. One of the interesting things about the 2011 flood is that a lot of these sandbars are highly coveted for turn and flood investment like that were created during that 2011 flood. Some of us predicted the water went down these sandbars all the way down the street. That wasn't the case. The water went through. What's going to happen in the future? Uh, Looking to see like a stick around. Um, then we move downstream, this is Sioux City, Iowa. And um, this is the end of the West River right here. This is the uh, Park of State Park. And you can see that the river is suddenly, instead of being all this complexity, is suddenly doing these nice, almost mechanical looking meanders. This is called a Kensler's Bend, and it's a part of the river that the coal engineer uses. Um, I've heard it described as training the river. Navigation starts in Sioux City. Navigation down a state here. This area you can hear there is, is um, trying to make the river behave like a channel on its navigation. Area. And so there's a bank collector in here, and a new and things like that. Uh, Sioux City enjoys the benefits of that dam, highly regulated flows, until 2011, that was. And as a result, go to Sioux City, you see all sorts of infrastructure, parks, casinos, hotels, right down next to the river. As you move further downstream on the river, you don't see that. That's because there's more and more flooding because you're going downstream. So near the dam, there could be this development, the waterfront, that other places uh, uh, that I don't know. I don't want to sound like a pro dam, I'm just pointing out that communities of low dams tend to value the dams for that reason. And uh, the river downstream is uh, 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 Sioux 
say you start seeing the little wing dikes in here, or little uh, the stubby wing dikes, to maintain the self-showering navigation channel, which has to be 300 feet wide and 10 feet deep. The piggies usually will be downstream from um, Sioux City Depot. One of the big benefits of the shoots is the restoration projects. This is uh, the Kingdom Bend, uh, an area where there's been a lot of reconstruction and reconnection and recovery to create more uh, front-plane habitats and uh, connected off-plane habitats. And also a point here to shoot from in here. Uh, this is California Bend, it's actually a lawyer in Alaska. background you can hear, you can see the complexity of the habitat. It's a very high productive area. Uh, we were really the second one picks up, and it's not possible to do these backwise because the second will come down and fill these in. Closer to the city, the second one will come down and do that. The downstream you can't do that, so you start to see flow through the shoots. This is Boyer shoot, um, now we hold our habitat into it here. Um, this is downstream of Oroma, the platform will come in, the platform will come in. Of water, also the water, also the of sediment. And one of the issues that we've been dealing with with Calisperger now is how much of the Calisperger is still being centered and how much they want to go through the time of practice. Well, the last couple of years we've found out some data showing that some of those things in that part of the class have actually spawned a fair well. So it's like a different can of water. This is another uh, restoration site. Bill, and lower down the bills. One of the issues when you start doing this with restoration is can these restoration sites be good neighbors on the front line? What happens uh, at these sites when you have a levy and agricultural land for the rest of it? This is the case here at Hamburg in 2011. This is up in Hamburg Bend. There's a lot of change up here, the channel widened. That's a local cut city. That's a good thing. This is lower down the this was a bad thing. Jumped out of his bags, broke through the levee here, and this is a big splay of sand that's created by the levee break on the way down. And so, this sort of question about whether the restoration projects and agriculture may have can exist side by side and continue to be an official of some protection.
by checking what the blue is written. Uh, in the further downstream, this is an area I've worked on quite a bit in the restoration project. Here, the valley is not narrowly bounded by these uh, cliffs, uh, harder rock on the uh, Ozark Plateau. Um, and because the big money fish and wildlife that you purchase this entire bottom, they don't have any of those native problems. They don't have all the problems right here, they don't have all the problems right here. The native problems are across the river right here. These neighbors think that this sheep is a way to break the money. Those kind of issues are also the key to the problems. This, in fact, is the Jameson shoe. This is the shoe that shut down shallow water habitat in the Missouri River because the Missouri Clean Water Commission objected to sediment coming out of here in the river. It's been five years now. Might be getting close to the right now, and that would be great. But uh, it just shows how controversial things can be going on. Put this in here, it's a little tributary, this is the river. Again, we have this question of managing the main stem. Can you understand the main stem without understanding the tributaries? So there's probably a science we're doing now on the Osage and the Gaston Abram, we get to the downstream, see how much fish in the main stem actually uses tributaries, something you don't know very much about. Now, I'm just going here to mention that there are a number of utilities in the world that are this one. This is a modern power plant, a coal fire plant. They use water to fill in the streams, the water in the river. It kills off the generators and it goes back to the river. You should hear fish and fish on the streams, as well as the fish that are going on in the river. This is regulated, but as many as all the people are starting to get back in the pressure plants, whether those have any effect, for example, sucking in and killing the baby swimming. We get further down towards the St. Louis, it's the channel for flexing to fix up the river. And it's partly because we're getting down to the more green area next to the Mississippi River. We come up from the island, we come up to shoot the area, and the other areas are the flex down to that. Much more complex than you see, say, up here in the Kansas City area. And then uh, all of this money, the confluence, the Missouri River coming down here, the city river coming down here, and I think we're all aware of the controversy right now, the questions about how the Missouri River dams and reservoirs should be operated to provide water for navigation in the Mississippi River. Uh, Mississippi River, uh, the drought situation in Mississippi River is substantially uh, not more dire than it is on the Missouri River. And then this issue about the release of world water on the Missouri River goes to the navigation down here has economic um, dimensions to it. It's not legal dimensions. The Corps of Engineers are saying, no, we legally can't do it. And economically, the commercial navigation on the Mississippi River is a tremendous amount of water. The question is how there should be coordination between the rivers or how much coordination can take place to. Uh, like uh, for the best social economic and environmental benefits. Uh, so anyway, to us to uh, sort of just sum up, uh, geography matters. If you talk to someone who doesn't get it, doesn't understand the Missouri River, it's probably because they're coming from a different place. They actually live in a different place. They have a different perspective of the river. I think the hope that I've shown is that there's a wide range of environments that have a a wide range of different kinds of ways to be reduced. And so people really do have different people. Um, the other point table point, the Zoom is a semi-air basin. Uh, it doesn't have as much water as some people think. And the chances are there's always going to be increasing use of that water and some of the users uh, as well. The MCA system for a lot of uh, important social economic benefits, uh, uh, public control, water supply, power generation, etc. They do have to achieve the fluidity and raise about the depth of the ecosystem. This is going to achieve the water temperature and achieve the sediment. These are the things that directly fit in the ecosystem of the river. 
That's what is the lowest one. So there aren't any lakes downstream from that. So potentially, the second comes out, moves the car downstream. And get all the way down to the And what's interesting is that even in Louisiana, you know, that's, that's their side. They're concerned, you know, for a long time. They're concerned that this side isn't going down to maintain the salt marshes down there and uh, Ferry Islands.